The dog park. Okay. A little frozen. Here we go. Okay. All right. So welcome back to your uh, regularly scheduled meeting. So quick update what we're doing now. So this was what we were going to do before, but we changed. So the the premise of what we've just gone through is to get everybody a chance to sort of have an intimate and small group discussion around the six pillar areas. Now the goal is to, as a full group, look at you know, what came out of those discussions and start talking about, okay, you know, which of these goals and or others should we be considering for our strategic priorities for the coming four years? Um, and what the, um, you know, and just what the other issues are. So this is a more, a little less free form, but more focused on, okay, let's get some, see if we can get this around what the board and board staff could be focused on. So we change these, um, but people now has become licensees. So we'll start with licensees and it'll be innovation and operations. So those names are different. And today, those are the three we're going to do this full group discussion on, and then we'll come back tomorrow and look at um, regulation and compliance. Uh, actually, wait a minute. Licensing and registration is now operations. I don't know if they said that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I did. Okay. And then tomorrow it'll be um, whatever the other. Communication <laughs> <laughs> is one. Prince will be another. And uh, regulation and compliance. That's it. Okay. So, um, Here's the what was done with the, the licensees. And as you'll recall, some of the objectives. Okay, sure. Oh, and then for purposes of the agenda, in order to um, complete what we need to do and not go long, we're going to jump over the working to consensus. I'm focused a little more time on the board mission, uh, vision, and values, or what we call the purpose statements, just so you're aware we jump that one. All right. Um, so, You've heard about licensees. We talked about a lot of different accomplishments, um, trends and challenges. I realize this is really small to see up here, but let me just quickly just think through the, some of the goals. Consider engaging in school pipeline programs, better foundation for techs to enter the job market, account for potential trends that will impact the future, consider eliminating quotas without adequate staffing, Mandated staffing ratios, engage stakeholders throughout the state, consider AI tech licenses, um, tuition remissions for diverse candidates. Um, look at how applications written, et cetera, from equity lens make part of decision making and implementation, determine who can do what work. So those were the goals that came out of the three groups going through this. So what I'd like you to do then is, you know, having heard that, if you want me to read them again, because you, you're not sure you heard it, let's talk about licensee priorities. That's really what we're aiming for. So we could replicate the whole list, but I think the idea is to talk about it more as a full group for deciding yeah, that should be something that we should do. What about the conversations you had about the licensees emerges as something that really ought to be considered our focus attention, or do we want to just continue doing what we're doing and kind of make that clear? I'll give you a chance to think about that and then Nobody has anything to say. What I'm going to do is go around the board members and ask you to each. Like, uh, so yeah, pull teeth after you, lunch. A defensive measure might be to come up with something right away. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and and by the way, this is not just the board now. This is everybody can talk. But if I have to go around the table, I'm not going to go around 19. 
anything emerge around licensees, things we should be considering doing? Yes. So board member Chin. This board member Chin, in not not knowing history and and whatnot of this board, one of the things that I had asked about is why um, in the health occupations classes in high schools, pharmacy isn't engaged in, um, you know, we, we do CNA and they do dentistry and they do all kinds of things where they have high school students, either junior, seniors, um, 16 and older, um, doing some of these occupations and being able to, I think after a certain amount of training, they can get their CNA, but why we're not able to do like an intern pharmacy tech or something. I don't know what you have done in the past for 16 year olds, but I heard that there were 16 year olds in pharmacies in years past. But if that's a pipeline into industry and encouraging people to continue education, that's something that I was just thinking through. Anybody have any input for just facilitator Pandy? I've said that for hours. Um, to, uh, that you're aware of about that because kind of ties to the goal, which is here, of consider engaging in school pipeline programs. So it kind of gets into overall what can or should or to pharmacy be involved in promoting the pipeline of people into the profession at whatever category they, you know you want technician basically intern would be a gateway to professional role <laughs> yes that's a staff member hit again um <laughs> There was no minimum age uh, previously for technicians. And when the board changed the pharmacy technician to no longer be renewable, they also changed the minimum age to 18. Mm -hmm. um, someone could only have their license for up to two years. So, and they weren't eligible to take the national certification until they were 18 also. So that that's when they raised it. And we couldn't have anyone younger than that because they wouldn't be able to obtain their certification. Uh, so I think I think there's room in there, but that's why it was changed. So, so this is board member Chin. So technically, it was done because of the rule that we have now changed. Correct. And so technically, we could reconsider maybe being involved in health occupations and having pharmacy tax at 16 again because they can renew and there are lots of 16 year olds who are looking for jobs and careers but knowing a 16 year old football player <laughs> relative <laughs> oh he needs a job <laughs> okay so i've sort of captured the the issue or the 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 big question here is, you know, the, the pipeline and, you know, that may be a little bit technical, but, you know, the, the life cycle, if you will, and how far upstream and what can sort of pharmacy do in your role to attract or make the profession attractive to people who would become licensees down the road. So one option is school so if you want to do middle school that's how no yeah no no um so and what is the program you it's called the health occupations program that's cool so that's one specific activity the bigger question is is this something that you know in the next two to four years should be an emphasis for the board to explore how you can affect this factor in 
capacity, capability, diversity of people participating in the profession. Yeah. Board Member Hammonds, um, this is one specific program, correct? Right. Um, I, I, I had asked, I think, a while back about the board's role in um, even much younger middle school. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know how, um, what role there is for the board to play as it relates to um, pipeline programs starting even before high school. Mm -hmm. um, that would help over time to actually grow and increase um, people going to feel a pharmacy, whether it's pharmacy tech, and, and then also the issues around diversity, right? Um, expanding the workforce. Um, and I think the feedback that I got was that there wasn't really a way for the pharmacy to really play a role um, in that. I mean, individually, we, I mean, I'm not a pharmacist, but individually, you know, you could, right? But as a board, it wasn't clear to me that that was something that was in the board's preview. Do? Anybody have an answer to that? in the past. Yeah. Board Member Hall, I don't have an answer, but I have encountered that before where I had um, opportunity to shadow someone that was a student and I was kind of told, well, they're too young. We could do a college student, but we don't want to do high school. <clears throat> I don't know if everybody's aware. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was even less attractive. Well, and that kind of tie back to the 18 year old. There's 18 year olds in high school. Um, board member, oh, sorry, board member Hammonds again. So would when we talk about communication and engage in the community, right? And we think about community, community is not just um, the licensees, registrants, it's also the people right, um, within the communities. And we do we do a newsletter? I don't think about communication. Um, is there space within our communication channels and how we communicate with the community, right, in terms of fostering um, a culture of, you know, reaching back, right? Um, in terms of voluntarily participating and mentoring um, and finding these programs if we provided the information because they're there, the high you know, middle schools, high school, career day, things like that. Is there a way for us to communicate and foster that culture um, by linking it to the um, workforce issues that we're currently having and expect to have if you said 14,000, you need 14,000 pharmacists and we only have 9,000, right? Each person right now in the field is feeling that stress and that burden. So if we have some way of communicating as a board and fostering a culture of um, volunteerism as it relates to pipeline programs. Would that be something that the board could undertake without necessarily the board itself actually doing the actual, because I don't know if you could, the actual work in the middle schools, high schools? Just throwing that out there. A good idea. I'm going to think about. Uh, 
board member Joyce. Um, at Providence St. Vincent's, we did participate in the high school health occupations program, and we did have high school students from the local high schools, uh, Sunset High School, et cetera, Lincoln, uh, that came to St. Vincent's to shadow the technicians and the pharmacists for a few hours per day. Um, I, I found it to be um, a, a good experience for them. They asked you know, appropriate questions. They're very interested in either pharmacy or medicine or pursuing healthcare. Um, and uh, and then COVID happened, and then that stopped. Uh, I think it, sh it should definitely be revisited. But as was mentioned, how as the board do we go forward with uh, promoting that so we can expand uh, education and access to the jobs in pharmacy? But it, it was a, a good experience. From from you know, I, I saw this. The, some of the high school students actually become pharmacy. Um, pharmacy students at OSU later down the road and become interns. And I saw that progression. Um, and, you know, I, it, it was a good experience. So. I don't know if that's something we can do, but. All right, um, so let's so this is, you know, there's a lot of things you could do. But again, the big question is as a priority, a strategic priority is trying to boost the pipeline, something that should be, you know, some things that we should work on that we would describe in the plan. Right now, I'm not getting a huge warm fuzzy about that, but there's other options. So another topic that came up here um, was around staffing ratios and um, mandated staffing. Uh, quotas. So that's kind of all around a whole different topic, which is, you know, the whole, um, I just call it, you know, staffing. Where is size? That's not the end. Staffing, let's just say capacity, right? That, that's just a generic phrase. So in terms of that as an area for the board to be exploring as a priority directing staff we really want you to focus on how we address this challenge of capacity as it's been expressed in terms of ratios in terms of um there there was a thing that came up around number of transactions per hour all that kind of stuff so thoughts on this as a potential uh, area of exploration uh yeah, I think it it it's a should be a priority. It should be something that should be looked at um, in, in terms of looking at um, as other states have done, um, looking at quotas and uh, performance metrics uh, that are um, unreasonable when you're understaffed. And so, <laughs> sorry, I'm say the least because I'm under the least. <laughs> Um, and so, but then, you know, we have to go on and define what is adequate staffing. And to, to do that, one of the things we can do is look at ratios. Um, you know, PBMs, right? Uh, should I even go down that road? Um, <laughs> and DIRs. Um, we uh, get, we hear the feedback from the community pharmacies. Uh, and the independent pharmacies are closing left and right uh, mm -hmm. because they cannot afford to, to stay open. Um, we need to look at when ratios and quotas um, are appropriate from a business model, and we need to look at it from, from patient safety model. Because if you are, you are trying to meet a quota and you're understaffed, you're going to have mistakes. So as the board, we need to look at quotas. We need to look at uh, what other states do as far as uh, patient safety and how we can address these uh, quotas and uh, so-called performance metrics. That's a euphemism for quotas. Um, so I, I, th I think we need to go head on. This should be one of the topics that we uh, seriously delve into um, to see what we can do as a board to look at these quotas, quote unquote. Okay. 
So board member Joyce has put forth some strong perspective or advocacy for this. So let's let's do the round table here now to see other board members think. So um, I'll come have you go last board member Doyle. So board member Patel, what are your thoughts about the this as a priority for the board? And you can say, no, I think we had other fish to fry or it's great. You know, this is going to get a barometer of you know, what's the direction you think. This is board member Patel. And when we say the quota, right, performance metrics, that you have to realize that every pharmacy outlet, they also get reimbursed and paid for performance pet metrics, right? Mm -hmm. We also know, as you told me earlier, that when we find a solution, and if the solution is not working, because maybe we are not looking the actual problem, right? So if you think whatever we discussed today, right, what is the actual problem is? Is the PBM and low reimbursement, right? But we nothing we can do about it. So yeah, you can put quota like hundred prescription per pharmacist, five hundred prescription per pharmacist, but it's not going to be sustainable. It's not right. And then second question is like, um, if we are going to put that quota. If you are going to put the ratio, are we going to hold everyone accountable? Whether it's an in-state pharmacy, out-state pharmacy, mail order pharmacy, hospital pharmacy. And if the answer is yes, then are we going to inspect all those mail order pharmacy, whether they are going to do the quotas or they are going to follow up the ratio and the quota? Right? Because only seven state they have the self-inspection form. So as I told you, we are not addressing the right issue. So we can come up with any solution. I, I, I don't see it working. Like, yes, it is patient safety, and I'm not denying that. Mm -hmm. Not denying that. But then which one would you prefer? The pharmacy is open and some patient get the medication or pharmacy is closed because of those quota and ratio and no one get the medication. The one of the county only have three pharmacy. The two of the pharmacy don't take the express script. Where this patient will go? The whole county has three pharmacy. Think about it. Put the quota and put the ratio, but we are not addressing the real problem here. That's the PPM and your reimbursement. Okay. So thank you. That's my three minutes. Good. <laughs> okay. uh, board member Beeman. Member Beeman, not for my three minutes. Um, <laughs> I am not in favor of of ratios. I understand how they could, in certain situations, help with patient safety. However, I think they would be far more limiting and impactful on patient safety than what we realize in talking about them. In the day-to-day -day of having to go in and make sure that you are a pharmacist and you have only three techs to call and two of them call in sick and you and one tech who probably could make at least a slower workflow and make decisions within that workflow to help as many patients as, as safely possible, your other option, oh, don't have my ratio, close this pharmacy. And that's not, that's not. Also with ratios, you have insufficient personnel brought in to give you the number. Here's a float tech. Here's the, and, and, and they're a different type. Everyone works at a different level. Everyone works as a different personality. Everyone interfaces with patients differently, and it doesn't make for a great day in a lot of cases. So uh, Cindy could be my tech one day, and she and I could handle 300 prescriptions, whereas Priyal could be my tech another day, and we might only be able to handle 200 prescriptions safely. And it sure. just, it's very, very hard to put that into these are the ratios you have to meet. There's also business models that don't rely on that because they're using technology efficiently, because they're using different mm -hmm. methods. And I, I get that retail is where it, really where we're seeing the crunch right now. And to be quite honest, it's really been where we've seen the crunch for several years. It's just at a hyper sensitive state right now. But putting more and severe and limiting restrictions on the people that are going into that and continue to go into that 
that that that job day after day after day and just being more punitive is not the way to empower our licensees to try to make things better and patients safer. And so when I hear the word ratio, I just I kind of freak out. <laughs> Go ahead, Cindy. <laughs> uh, board member Vipperman, I said to her, I'm so glad you're going before. <laughs> Uh, and I agree with everything she said. And what she didn't say that I am um, that I want to bring up is that we um, have rules that we have put in place for um, PICs and pharmacists to have a safe place and to make that decision. And um, I think that's what um, that's where this falls into. It's their decision how many they can work with, who they can work with, how many they can do a day. We have done that. I don't think that adding more rules is and especially more rules that it's going to be um, more um, more um, prescri prescriptive is going to help one bit. So I am not in agreement with the um, ratios and um, whatnot. So Are you channeling the bar more? I am channeling the bar months. I'm not. Well, I'm not. I, don't don't tell her. Don't tell her. Time. Not tell her. No. Sorry, but I, I, I just know we've already we worked really hard for those safety, um, those safety uh, rules, and that we've done this. We've we've done this. I don't think that putting more on that is going to help. Okay, Mayor Hemmings. Um, you don't have to say anything. You can just say. But board member Hammonds, I mean, I would, I didn't say <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know anything about whether the quota is blah, blah, blah. But what I will say is um, that sounds like probably something that's more short term need. Um, and I still go back to the pipeline issue because you have staffing issues. You still need to bring in more people into the profession you need to figure out how to retain them once they're there and then you won't have this issue so i'm thinking upstream versus you know short-term fixes but i get it good comment board member hall board member hall i mean yes i'm i want to go to the first point i am passionate about the pipeline and increasing um more young people to be interested in pharmacy. And I think it should be a priority. Um, to the ratios point, I don't think the intention is to put the pressure on the on the people working the front lines. I I, I think that idea comes from putting pressure on, you know, oh, if this much work is on a pharmacist and one technician, you need to get another body in here that's like a full time, not a temporary. And I don't know what that looks like, but that's the need that I see. And I don't know if the board has that ability, but I think that's so what that ratio thing is coming. Tap from. on the quota in a way that it helps it not go below a certain threshold. Right. You know, I know you've got the financial issues. It would be sort of putting a governor on the quota. Not not Kotec, like in a engine, you know. So the quotas can't go below or above whatever it would be a certain number in order to buy some safeguard. And I have no idea whether you can do that or not, but that I don't know when you say quota, it could be various ways of approaching it. Um but that may not be feasible. Remember Hall also, you know. Looking at it from a hospital side, it's like you're not going to shut down a hospital, but we need more techs. So how are we going to get more techs? You know, they're they don't have any money. So <laughs> what's going to force what's going to force them to give us another person? Mm -hmm. Board member Chin. Board member Chin. Um, I don't have anything more to add than what um, Beeman, Ripperman, Hemmons have already stated. I don't. I don't see where quotas are going to be helpful, and how to divvy that out to all the various situations and differences in practice doesn't make sense. I'm still in favor of the pipeline as being a priority. Okay. 
Board Member Hall. Good Doyle. <laughs> you look so much like. <laughs> yeah. Um, The staffing capacity I see is one component of um, safe practices. Uh, we, we have seen uh, several walkouts uh, of pharmacists at a variety of different pharmacies recently. Um, in the articles, I haven't spoken to any of the pharmacists, so I don't have firsthand knowledge of uh, the issues that they uh, can cite, which are undesirable um, places to, to work, uh, but they are um, demanding uh, safer areas for themselves and also for their patients. Um, I don't I, I've heard the testimony here today. I don't know that I am uh, sold one way or the other that a um, ha having a regulator of a certain number of prescriptions for, for any one individual is the best way to go. I would like to get uh, to see if more data is available on that. Um, and so I, uh, but I, I think that uh, we need to go back to the safe practices work group recommendations that uh, had been uh, provided to the board by the work group that had been coalesced and mm -hmm. re-review those um, notes and information and, and see what their recommendations were on this uh, piece of information. Um, with regards to the, the pipeline, uh, this has been something that schools and colleges of pharmacy have been dealing with for quite some time, and now it continues to be uh, an issue that is uh, because the number of uh, graduates uh, coming out of the program, it's affecting um, the, the practice of pharmacy. Um, A low decline in number. Yes. yes. Yeah. And with with regard to having been involved with the School of Pharmacy, trying to figure out how we can improve pipelines and get more uh, students interested in in pharmacy. It's been very difficult, uh, and that is also including national programs that the uh, Eric, uh, Association, uh, AACP, uh, American Association for the Colleges of Pharmacy, uh, has been trying to to solve as well, and um, and many there are many persons that are not going into pharmacy because they see greater uh, applicability, or greater opportunity to be practicing in a, another health profession such as uh, PA, uh, the PA program at um, at. Uh, Pacific University is booming with applications, and uh, and so there there's a, a different ben uh, risk benefit ratio that is seen by potential applicants with regard to how well they can treat the patients or what they can do with the patients and um, and what their workload is, and so I think that if uh, if I think that uh, a problem with the pipeline is that the students are hearing or the potential students are hearing from and seeing what's going on in pharmacies now that they become less inclined to be involved in pharmacy and choose other uh, health professions pathways. So why I don't agree that it's the board's particular road to go out to be advocating for a uh, for the pipeline um, that I, I think that that's um, you know, persons in pharmacy practice, you know, the companies and also the schools and colleges of pharmacy. I think that uh, by trying to look at, say, pharmacy practices and helping agencies uh, with the management of the practice of pharmacy in their uh, 
business model, so to speak, that will in turn improve the um, the environment that the pharmacists are working, and that will lead again to a higher uh, or a stronger pipeline of persons then uh, again interested in pharmacy. Okay, so um, we need to move on to the innovation topic, but I think the, the point of the conversation, looking at licensees, and these are the two things, I mean, I've been scanning these lists, the numbers down here, or these posters down here around goals, and these are pretty much how they all break out, right? There's some nuances there, but it's pretty much what are we doing to support the pipeline through education and other things, and how are we regulating, managing, encouraging the right capacity. So is there anything else you want to throw up here right now is, you know, somehow this got missed as a goal as we move forward on the licensee pillar in our work over the next few years beyond continuing and finalizing the, the implementation of the regulations that start in March. Yeah. Remember him. And so my question is, how has the board contributed to this problem of staffing? <laughs> I'm not the facilitator. I can't call on you. <laughs> You're gonna regret asking that. I guess. <laughs> Good to know. So what? Well, like. No, um, uh, our rules micromanage professionals. Pharmacists have their doctorates in pharmacy. And our rules and the, especially retail websites, don't treat pharmacists as such in a lot of cases. Uh, patients don't, definitely don't treat you as such. Um, and though we are here for patient safety, a, a big issue with a lot of pharmacists in that setting is how patients interact with them and treat them. And it's it's a big mental tax. It's a big uh, threat to your mental health and to your feeling of safety in your workplace. Um, and our rules have evolved such that in the hopes of clarity, they are boxes to check. Mm -hmm. And thus, our caseload has gone up because we're not checking on the boxes. Whereas if we wanted to, and it's hard to find that line to, um, be a more desirable profession, then we should be treating our licensees as professionals and have a certain level of professional judgment allowed. And, and there is in some areas, but then there isn't in others. And I know a lot of it has to do with what we are, are allowed to, to do and say in statute, but we are for lack of a better term, micromanaging our licensees in my opinion and not letting it be a, a profession, but more of a job. And so for the time invested and the potential time to invest in that, if you're looking into pharmacy, it's, and, and it's not that way in every job set setting, um, but the outlets are, will take on a lot of that checking the boxes for for the individual, but because there's a lot of boxes to check and outlets have their own boxes to check, but there's just so many more boxes. Mm -hmm. And with so many more boxes, we have so many more, you didn't do this. And, and so that rise in rules and that rise in cases to me are not a coincidence. Um, and I'm just one person, I am not the board, but it is, when I was an intern, I wasn't ever told don't go into pharmacy. But as I've worked over the years and have seen preceptors interact with interns, a lot of them tell their, their interns don't go into pharmacy. And that's been happening for a decade. So we're here a decade later and a lot of people are choosing other pathways because of how the pharmacist is perceived. And you even look at it in terms of um, like media and TV shows and movies, we're always kind of a joke, right? Like we are, <laughs> or we are, our pharmacists are portrayed a little bit as, and it's very different now, but that I don't think that perception has really evolved much. Okay. So 
Other other comments? Yes, Board Member Patel. Board Member Patel, and yeah, I echo, echo most of the Board Member Beeman said that's true. We, our rules are way too prescriptive. Like you don't even allow to make their you know, clinical judgment or just the professional judgment. We we are doctor of pharmacy. We go to six years for school. Why there is too much prescriptiveness? So you have to check the box from your organization. You have to check box, whatever the, your BBM contracts are. You have to check the box from the Oregon Board of Pharmacy. So you're checking box, box, and box instead of providing the public safety, right? You, you I am going to be worried more about my license than actually doing my job and providing the public safety. So if anyone asks me in here that I know the reimbursement, we can fix it, right? Staffing issue right now, we can fix it. It's not a quick overnight fix, right? Um, <clears throat> what we can do as a board, at least we can bare minimum, they, we decrease the administrative burden in a sense of not be handcuffing, less prescriptive. Let your pharmacist use their professional judgment instead of keep checking boxes. That's that's what I would say. Because the rest of the thing, I think it will take years before, even if you start the pipeline today, it will take years. But this is immediate. We, we can do. All right. So I've added this, which is the, I, I'm just interpreting what you both said is supporting professional fulfillment. I wrote, fight the box checking. My sense is it doesn't get addressed directly here. It get addressed maybe in some of the other pillars to support to address this. Oh, for our memory. But the, so does that, can that become a goal as it relates to this pillar? Because licensee is a pillar by itself, right? Mm -hmm. Could that then become a goal in terms of being less prescriptive? Less micromanaging. I think. Jackson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm just going to put it. I mean, if we've identified that as a negative contributor, right, or barrier, wouldn't we want to then make that a goal to address that? This is board member saying licensee is a pillar. This is board member Moon. I don't know if that's the same goal for every board member, though. And that's, that's where we had. Yeah, and that's where our rules discussions come in. So okay. it's. Oh, okay. so that's yeah. a different pillar. Well, no, it's just. Well, I mean, it could come under regulation. It kind of is all encompassing, but it's. It's tomorrow. It, well, it's for. You asked why. Why? I told I told you my perspective as one board member as why. And I don't speak for everybody else here and other people may see things very differently, but I I I I see it as not a not a coincidence. And I I know that I've heard board member the the bar more say the same thing. So that's one, two, three. Yes. Davis, I think what you're talking about is possibly looking at standards of practice rules. Is that which oh, is that the keyword of what you're trying to? I was just trying to help I, facilitate. Potentially, it's standards of practice. Long ago, we used the term bumpers, providing bumpers, but not being as narrowed. Um, and, and I think we get into it with certain rules. Uh, but the way in, I think the, the because we've had because of the reorganization of the rules and, and and the the amount of rules, it's been harder to get into this. Um, we're just a little bit more limited in discussion time to kind of see how this is, how our rules might be too narrow. Um, so I I think maybe standard of practice, which I know we don't. Love that because like other professions, we don't have a standard necessarily officially is my recollection. Uh, but but just the I guess the standard practice was yeah. Um, not a better to just trying to give words to yeah. This board member Hammond, I just know that I've been on the board for a year, and this has come up several times. Um, 
So I think it's important enough that we need to address it. Um, and it shows up just in listening um, as it relates to this licensee killer and probably in some of the other ones too. So we keep yeah, it's not just like away from it, but I think we yeah. need to address it. Okay. And so, one quick comment. Yes, sir. Um, so are we abandoning um, the technician, um, uh, the discussion around national certification? Are we done with that? Are we just not going to? Well, it didn't show up in your previous discussion. So okay. I, I was kind of basing on kind what of up here. National certification, is that something that? I mean, I, mean, I know I'm in the minority uh, as far as board members <laughs> that support uh, national certification. I mean, I'm a, I still support it. Um, mm -hmm. Board member Bipperman. Yes, I support that. Always have. So ever wanted to come as the, two, as the two technicians on the board. I mean, you know, we both support uh, looking into national certification. I mean, not in the next year or two, but maybe 2026 or so. Um, just in terms of uh, patient safety, public safety, mm -hmm. I strongly feel that nationally certified technician, uh, you have the official document, you have the foundation uh, there, you have the edu educational foundation there, uh, as opposed to someone just comes off the street and you get your OJT there at the local pharmacy. I mean, that's all good, but with national certification, you have your uh, your foundations there. Uh, you have your base knowledge there, and you can advance from that. And with PTCB, you have different certifications there. And I just think down the road, in terms of patient safety, not immediately, uh, that's something that should be considered. Okay. So, um... Probably not going to get through the three we wanted to get through today. We want to spend some time talking on the mission. Let's change gears and talk about innovation. Maybe a different energy around that. Um, Rudy, could you bring the innovation? So, you know, these topics are not dead. We need to kind of go through each one and then we'll come back tomorrow and talk about them. Not on the painting. Oh, great. I don't know if you notice that this every board in the wall over here is a select Oregon wood sample, <laughs> which means that they won't let us put anything on that. Hey guys, don't let us. Kind of like. Um, okay. So innovation. We're going to not abandon the licensees. We're going to talk about innovation technology as. A potential area of priority and what activities under that could we um, consider? So, um, actually, this is the All right. Um, so, we have going through, um, there was reduced waste that came up near the end. Um, Leveraging other agency technology resources that specifically was tied into at the time of discussion around translation um, capacity. There is explore AI as an option to support patient communications, education, safety, and counseling. Um, uh, another potential goal: have staff investigate ways to provide better language and visual or hearing impaired communications. Um, through technology, explore drones and other alternative delivery, <laughs> um, use innovation technology to overcome barriers to equitable access to dispensing. And since one of the accomplishments, as you'll recall, has been that we have rules now that allow um, kiosks and uh, other dispensing technologies to be put in place, track measure the uptake and effectiveness of those new technologies and even should we have some targets for what we would like to see so we can kind of measure against some type of let's call it an uptake target so out of those suggestions on yeah this really you know resonates and i think ought to be uh one of our primary innovation priorities Yeah. 
when they do the round the table. <laughs> board members. Um, this time I'm going to start with board member Doyle. Thoughts on what, what if anything, should be a priority for the agency around innovations? It's a compelling thing that we need to set some priority around doing. So we didn't say I don't see any of these rising to that level. <laughs> yeah. Um, I will uh, take a pass and uh, come back at the end. Okay. Remember Beeman. Remember Beeman. Can I interrupt the roundtable and start? Sure. Because I, I, I hate being first when I don't have it yet. But um, I like the idea in terms of an internal goal of leaning on other agencies technology to kind of expand our because it goes into so many other pillars of communication and licensing and outreach and all the things that we're concerned with so i like that if the technology is there or if it's something that another agency is using or has access to or somehow we can piggyback onto that it saves us from rebuilding the wheel i think that's one that um stood out to me as uh, because on other things we saw how staffing and and time management can be an issue. So if if we can lean into technology that's already there, that would be helpful. Speaking of technology, <laughs> all right. So. I'm going to use the word enterprise technology. You understand that's state government's term for state government. Um, so leverage other agency enterprise, their agency slash enterprise technology. And maybe there's another phrase you want to add to that. Even that I didn't get, but that I can fill out. I think that's, I think that's, yeah, I can't, okay. yeah. Okay. Good. Um, well, then I'll. But the roundtable may be more of a ping pong. Sorry. That's all right. It's fine. I'm I'm fine with moving it around. So, um, board member Joyce, how about you? Um, sure, board member Joyce. So, um, as I stated earlier, the, I mean the use of technology is paramount uh, in regards to patient safety. Um, we'll see it in um, our discussion here with. Uh, down the road with um, IV admixture, uh, the use of the use of um, technology there um, to ensure patient safety with uh, mixing IVs. Um, my concern is, um, you know, I, I do support the use of AI. I um, don't know as a board what we can do because there's that conflict between how much can AI do, and then will they replace pharmacy jobs in the future? Um, so, you know, my concern is as a board, what can we do to, uh, I don't know, make sure no one loses their job, right? We, we want to support patient safety. AI has a, a strong, um, uh, influence in, um, I, I can see how that can definitely, um, improve patient safety, the use of AI. Also, the human side of it, like, are we going to lose jobs? Uh, can the board mandate anything to prevent that? Or should we mandate anything to prevent that? Um, AI, definitely. Um, I know that, that that's being looked at in the federal level. Mm -hmm. uh, but as the board of pharmacy and the use of AI, um, how much can we allow it to do uh, and is it really going to promote patient? Is it really going to promote patient safety, or is it going to just replace human human jobs? Mm -hmm. so, 
those are just something that, I mean, I, I think it definitely needs to be something that we discuss soon because AI is progressing really fast. Mm -hmm. I just said explore impact positing and negative of AI. So that's another potential objective or, or goal. Um, I'm not trying to focus on anyone. Um, board member Bipperman. I'm, I'm not going around, I'm bouncing around. You, you, you just be don't be surprised if I call on you next. Okay, uh, board member Bipperman. So for me, the important uh, part on the board there was getting the um, the languages in all of the um, all of the categories, like um, all the languages in all the paperwork that we have at the board, like the registration and all these things, and then also uh, making the um, accessibility for um, all let people of different languages to get their uh, medications list. Sometimes that doesn't happen. I know that we have rules around that, but um, I think that's an important part of um, innovation is making sure that people who speak a different language get the information in their language and they know how to take their medications. Not only that, but if they want to get a license, then they can read the, the, the registration on the license because I don't think they have that now. Is that correct? Uh, is that right? It's only, how many languages do we have in of use for the application? Yes. Okay. So that's my that's that's it. So I think that's important um, to make sure that the languages are um, accessible to all um, potential licensees. Patients for patient safety. Um, I think that encompasses the innovation, right? Is is that that right? There's something that says over there on that. I think. Well, I think it was partly the language came up partly because um, I think it was the leverage in it has language translation capability that is not accessible to. Um, Board of Pharmacy today, so there was kind of a connection. Um, I think it's important that we that we bring that out because that's a huge barrier to many, 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 many people. It's also actually the um, vision and hearing. And yes, yes, thank you. Those as well. I mean, it's okay if you have a little sign there, but does everybody know about it? Nope. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm going to bounce around. So remember Hall. Remember Hall. I don't know if um, this is where it needs to go, but I mean, we talked about the lockers and the kiosks and how they're not being used. I know there's hardly any 24-hour pharmacies in the city of Portland. <laughs> they're all in the outskirts. So, I mean, we need to think about access and maybe using technology, getting the word out to people about it. I don't know what the barriers are. It doesn't sound like we quite know why there hasn't been as many kiosks and lockers, but I don't know what that looks like. I know the answer. Yeah, yeah they're expensive. I know. Turn on investment. Okay. Um, so you don't, do you think that should be a, a, a goal then to? I mean, I agree with the um, increasing um, the option of having different languages for the applications and especially for patients. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I have board member Patel. Board member Patel. 
Yeah, to to your question, yeah, it's uh, it's it's more money to implement, and then our rules as well. Okay, for for certain things, it's just like you have to have fourteen language access for the kiosk or early like remote dispensing. Sometimes it's, it's hard to implement with those uh, kind of rules for the kiosk because. It's, it's a big national company, like they're not going to be Oregon specific, right? So that's that's going to be hard. Um, I love technology. I love AI, whether we like it or not, it's, it's here. How we are going to hold accountable to AI, I, I don't know. Um, the other thing is uh, implementing technology is a lot more expensive with the compounding rules is coming, you know, like, hey, you have to have image capture, you have to have ID, ID mis mixture technology and everything, but think about it. Right now, the pharmacy, they are struggling whether to hire a staff or whether to buy a vaccine, right? Just the spikes vex, the COVID new vaccine is super expensive, right? Or or, uh, or implement the technology. So that that is the challenges. And again, this is all tied up to your reimbursement. Um, so with this said, I love technology, but I don't think so. We should write in our rules that you must implement this. You must have this kind of technology. I don't think so. We should do that. Yeah, I don't think anybody was suggesting that. Well. Well, I'm just saying. Yeah, okay. For future. Yeah, good. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, board member Hemmings. Um, Board Member Hammonds, I just wrote something down. I think it's in line with what Board Member Vipperman mentioned, but I just wanted to expand that. Um, it's um, that in terms of thing about equity mm -hmm. that we need to um, consider and look at um, who may be left out as we innovate. Um, just from the very beginning of when we think about innovation, whatever that looks like, that we think about equity and who might be left out of whatever innovation we come up with. My only comment. I would just add, is it okay to add left out or brought in through technology? I think you you really want to think of it as a two-sided opportunity, right? Because I think part of the premise of a lot of technology is people in remote areas who don't have access to pharmacy could get their medications through some of the technology. So that's part of the a impetus for it. Ways in which innovation may create equity and also inequities. Yeah, that's the point. So there's sort of two sides of that. I'm just saying left out or brought in. So. But I, I'm, I'm, I remember him and I just, you know, I think that we all, we tend to lean on the side of creating opportunities, which is a good thing mm -hmm. in the work that we do. But then within that process, we often don't think about who may actually um, not actually have access to that opportunity or how that opportunity may create an issue of that for others. So that's why, I, you know, I framed it the way I did initially. Yeah, very good. Uh, let's see. Ooh, I got this one, yeah? I asked for a pass. And that's right, you asked for a pass. Um, and then come back to Right. <laughs> Board member Chen, do you talk on this already? No. <laughs> I have not. Good. Board member Chen has not spoken on this topic. Um, I have uh, just a clarifying question about the um, comments about our applications being in all of the. If, am, I, am I correct in understanding that on our applications, we're requesting that board staff look at having that? available in other languages or all the languages that we use for what we have to do for our prescriptions? Is that what I was hearing? Because the question was posed to our licensing um, staff. 
is it was that the because I'm just I'm and I'm all for equity inclusion and everything else. I'm I'm just trying to clarify in my brain. We have rules that if you're are born born graduate, I think you call it, that you have to have all of the English proficiency before you can sit for blah blah blah. And so dishes don't have to have that. Okay. So so were you thinking in terms of so so I'm just trying to clarify for um so, so interesting too then if pharmacy has the pharmacists and interns, because I think interns have to do the same thing, have to be proficient and be able to read, write, and communicate in English to be licensed. How does how <laughs> so text don't but it's assumed that they have to be because they have to be able to read the application this is board member Vipperman. i think they it should be in their own language so they understand what they're doing because many times they do not hmm. they do not what they do not understand what they're reading, reading and that comes through that comes through and back to us sometimes. So this is board member Chen. So, so are we talking about a technician? Mm -hmm. Doesn't understand what's in English? Yeah. I, I, but everything that we have in our pharmacy is in English. Well, that's the problem. That's why we should have it at least in Spanish and other languages. Have what? So what is the it? Just help me with what the, the it is. So they if have the registration in their own language. So they understand it better. Okay. So what happens in pharmacy where it where all the all the information that's in pharmacy for them to follow? Well, that's what I is that's what in, but that's what my that's what my that's what I'm asking is we should have not just that, but all of the things that we um have in pharmacy are rules. They should be available in other languages. It should not only be in, in English. 100 percent i i'm not arguing with you i'm just trying to see how that works i'm just trying to process it but i'm not arguing with no, it. i processing it i just and so i believe that i mean i believe that is that when they when uh language, people of other languages are reading our rules sometimes it um doesn't come across the same way as in english and i think that's a barrier staff member hennigan Staff member Hannigan, um, the area where I see uh, an issue for our licensees or applicants is in the non-prescription drug outlets. There are a lot of the um, Mexican Tandas or a lot of small companies that have non-prescription drugs that are not English speaking. And so following our regulations or completing the application, it can be very difficult for them. Okay. And, and if they call with questions, we don't have a way to communicate with them um, to help answer their questions because we don't may not have someone that speaks their language in office. I think we have one. You don't use a translator line. We have don't have access mm -hmm. to the one currently. <laughs> so that's 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 leveraging other agency yeah. technology. <laughs> yep, yep. So that 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 just opened up a whole another interesting aspect of. No. Kind of ties in <laughs> equity. <laughs> the government is a magic wand. So I think just as a reminder, anything we put here is not a solution. It's a an area to explore what the solution could be. And so, you know, I don't know what other agencies have in terms of their translation technology, but I'm kind of doubting you're going to have 10 languages, all our rules translated into, you know, but set some priorities, look at where the best opportunities are. Um, and that's part of what is more the implementation part of the street to street plan, not plan itself. Board Member Hammonds. Board Member Hammonds, the way um, that other organizations look at this is you look at what are the top five languages spoken mm -hmm. within the demographics, and that's the languages that you use um, provide um, your materials in. Um, that's one way to go about it. Great. I don't know. <laughs>
and I may be wrong on the numbers, but I think it's about five. I know Russian is in there. Yeah. <laughs> and Spanish. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so have all board members spoken on this? No. Uh, <laughs> uh, just a quick comment regarding the last bullet point on there about track and measure. Uh, my comment that I developed was akin to board members hall uh, with regards to um, looking at um, RDSPs and other things that we've implemented and gaining a better understanding of the, uh, the barriers to implementation and uh, learning from 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 that data uh, potentially how rules uh, can be readjusted and or uh, other situations mitigated to increase the uh, uptake. The, uh, Related to the comment on uh, drones up there and thinking <laughs> about things that are potentially coming down the the pike, the um, I remember uh, some testimony that was offered by the the public in meetings past where uh, they were advocating for um, maybe di some disagreement with the rules that we were promulgating and and. Uh, suggesting that uh, the pharmacies themselves, the businesses be allowed to, to innovate. And that has uh, stuck with me uh, since hearing that uh, testimony. And um, I uh, try to imagine this, is it a cart and a horse or a horse and a cart? And uh what can we be what can we do to combine the innovation priority with the communication priority to uh ensure that we be best understand what what ty types of things that uh businesses are looking to do uh and therefore how might we as the board of pharmacy be able to help facilitate uh uptake of those new things that they're uh thinking about doing and we can assure uh patient safety or around those things so actually i was gonna presumptuous and say i do think what you've hit here is something you kind of have to do because you created these rules to promote it and if you don't find out what the impact of the rules are you know it's there could be inhibitions based on the rules. We know it's expensive, so there's a we came up with a return on investment. That was uh, Director Fox's comment. So, you know, there may be levers that the board can pull. There may not be, but I think knowing what's happening and, and you know, at the same time, you know, in line with what Board Friend Hemis has talked about, you know, are there instances where the technology is actually reducing access to people because they, you know, stand in front of a machine and don't know what to do, you know, who knows? So I think that's kind of a, ideally, you don't have to be the first source of all the information, but yeah, there may be places where you have to be there. Okay, so we've got some, I think, pretty good things here. Again, this is not the final list, but we're just generating the ideas, then we're going to come back to them and try to kind of narrow down across all the pillars to, okay, these are the main things we really want to guide the uh, staff. Um, so time is getting tight and really was going to have Executive Director Fox kind of take the next thing. So, but he stepped out, he comes back. So, based on that, let's take a two minute break. Two minutes? Two minutes. Two minutes.
Okay, there you go. Your lines. I'm gonna go like super fast and a whole bunch of stuff. I'm not gonna do it. So it's killers. We went into one. <laughs> And then, and then say, okay, we're just gonna. All right. Still get another 30 seconds. So, the, all right, I'm, I'm kind of redoing it now. Uh, this is facilitator Pandy. So, the question that we had posed. This is something I think any agency should do on sort of a regular basis is to review how do you present your yourselves in terms of your purpose to yourselves and to the public and to other agencies, basically all the constituents out there. Um, so this was sort of the the moment of okay, let's do a reality check on what we have. So this is the current mission statement, which you all hear every time you start a meeting. And then the vision, really more of a slogan than a vision, is the Partners for a Healthy Oregon. And then uh, we also have the values. So talking to Executive Director Fox this morning, um, he had some, since he's come on board and kind of looking at these with fresh eyes, some questions and comments about these. So I thought uh, we should give him a chance. He's so inclined to share some of his thoughts on these. And uh, so I'm gonna let him. Thank you. Microphone. Thank you, facilitator Candy. <laughs> take a while. Like, oh, yeah, that's yeah. Really so no. um, members of the board, staff and, and public. One of the things that I was trying to as I was doing my due diligence during during the interview process, and then the last ten days with staff and and uh, individuals I've been able to speak with and look at not only what we have currently, but also what other boards of pharmacy and other states and how they share, explain, portray who they are, not just looking at it from the lens of this is how we've been doing things. This is. Oregon Board of Pharmacy, we're really looking at 10, 15 years out and and how can we possibly or consider changing and adding to some of the things that we have under our mission, vision and values. Um, and one of the areas too, I, I said it earlier about um, it's a priority of the governor with DEI. It sounds like it's a strong commitment and value of the board is definitely of staff. And so, um, one area that could increase our um, value proposition of what the Board of Pharmacy is, is looking at a equity statement that we um, state. And, and I'm gonna share just my, my perspective. And, and one of the things I thought is for the um, Board of Pharmacy of Oregon, we value diverse workforce and practice of pharmacy and seeks ways to promote uh, DEIB for belonging within the organization and with the public. Something short, sweet. Uh, it's somewhat broad, and, and but that's uh, I was just sharing that. Uh, and the second piece was really taking a look at the vision. Um, Partners for a Healthy Oregon. I know the rest of it is is really mirroring what um, the California Board of Pharmacy is. A lot of our um, pillars and, and, and items, but that's really a slogan. And I, and I was reading a lot of documents for a vision that the board could consider. And when I came up with to advance patient center pharmacy practice by strengthening and enhancing patient health for a healthy organ. So that's more encompassing and a little, little bit more to what we do, what the board does um, in Oregon. Uh, and there's other ideas I'll withhold from going over some of the other things that uh, I, I wanted to raise, uh, but open up if there's any questions on particularly those two items, the equity statement, the vision, 
uh, statement that I raised. Good thumbs up. Yeah, I like it. Definitely. Yep. All right. So um, mm -hmm. I may, this may streamline things a lot. Any any <laughs> suggestions, concerns? Maybe we should write it up here. Just, yeah. Let's take the the vision statement. Can, kind of see the can you dictate to me? This state to advance patient center pharmacy practice. By strengthening and enhancing. Patient health for a healthy organ. Um, so now, just just to raise the question, now you can see the words, <coughs> comments, thoughts. Okay. Uh, board member Doyle, um, just so I'm, I'm my perspective uh, for managing mission, vision, values, um, you know, is an appropriate time to um, maybe cross reference the uh, strategic planning and building the strategic planning off of the mission vision and, and values that, you know, they are very much related. Um, uh, I don't, I haven't yet been involved in a, um, that I recall uh, in the uh, nearly four years that I've been on the board that we've done a uh, close look at the mission and, and the vision um is um uh, is your question now uh that of if you will voting on changing our mission to this or are you looking to get a, a litmus if we wanted to investigate this further um my my experience uh with working with different groups is that it takes uh, a while and several iterations to go through to adjust the mission, vision, and, and values. So my, uh, my executive director Fox, uh, my intent was to bring this forth uh, for the board consider um, this language here for the vision, um, or if it's the will of the board to send it to some type of committee to do more fleshing out or whatever the common practice is. I'm trying to learn how we. And board member Doyle, I don't know what the common practice is. Uh, I don't know what, I mean, for the board of pharmacy, I don't know how these <clears throat> generated in years past. I wasn't on the board at that time. Oh. Yeah. The, um, the facilitator Pandy. So in 2019, when we first worked with the board, they had just gone through a process that we weren't involved in to update the mission, vision, and values. We we helped a little bit on the values in defining some of the bullets that were under each of these mm -hmm. headings, but they had agreed to the headings. So it's been since 2019 that this has been reviewed. We've done a quick check. I think sort of any issues with what we have up here, and there had not been any felt feeling that we needed to change anything. Um, one of the things that became clear as we were talking about building diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging into the purpose statements was it's missing. And so in discussions that uh, Bashti and Executive Director Fox and I had, we thought, okay, putting it into the values, and I think with some of the language that he had there, would, you know, we've got a hexagon there and only five values What's wrong with that? Um, so we could, you know, flesh out the the hexagon 
Um, so that was actually, I think we had the proposal was to add equity with some language to this. So he's drafted that. Then here, I think he's, I, I don't know what your thoughts are on the mission, what you're feeling yeah. on the mission. The, the mission, um, I, I think it, it speaks to, and it's in, yes, it's in statue. So that's already there. Uh, I didn't even touch that. It's just, yeah. it's just really looking at, you know, getting away from slogan base, but really focusing on what is our vision to be looking out years out, given the state of the pharmacy and, and where we're trying to go, where the board wants to see um, the pharmacy move towards. So I was trying to look at all the different documents and information that was coming my way and try to figure out what to recommend to the board to consider what you're actually are doing or possibly would do towards the future and try to give you a better vision statement and then also take a step back to look at the information from the governor's office and everywhere else try to understand the DEI perspective and so that's where the equity statement came from too. So and then you know in terms of what you know there's hundreds of agents or the thousands um, so I've only worked in a fairly small sample and observed a few others. This, as uh, Executive Director Fox said, is more of a slogan than a vision. Usually a, the mission describes what we do and what we're all about. This is our, our purpose. Also, sometimes it's a purpose statement. Here's what we do. The vision is in order to better accomplish that mission, these are the things that we would hope to improve on, enhance. That's the, the future state that we're aiming for. So I think this phrase is um, aiming more in the direction of it starts with a verb rather than just a statement. So it's it's a progressing yeah. concept. Um, yeah. So I think the question would be, yes, got two comments. Okay. Board Member Hall. Board Member Hall. I like the vision statement. I was wondering how we felt about adding to advance um oh, I had it written down to advance and protect patient-centered pharmacy practice um I don't know I just feel like that adding protect kind of includes the licensees too and that relationship that the pharmacists and technicians have the public so I'm going to add edits up here not to say it's final but just to capture the information It is for me. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> she said, I, she said, are we going to finish by 430? I said, you'll, you'll make sure that happens. <laughs> <laughs> Other comments? <laughs> yes, we're oh, sorry. Board member Hemming said her. So I had, a, um, could you show the complete vision? That's it. That's it. That's it. That's that, it. That's it. Um, Written down. It's just five pithy words. <laughs> so that was kind of the point that is, is it's really not really describing a vision. It's, you know, it's saying it's sort of restating who we are in very kind of general terms. Partners for help. That's the vision right there. Yeah, but believe it or not, yes. <laughs> she can she's incredulous. <laughs> <laughs> So that's why the proposal is, let's say, something a little bit more descriptive. Without okay. vision, people perish. Board, board member Vibrant? Um, I would Thank love you. it if it would say enhance, enhance patient safety. Or does. <clears throat> does it say safety in there? Enhancing patient health. Does it, does. it does not say safety in there. And that is what we do here at the board. The mission. Well, it's, it's, part of the mission. It's part of the mission. I don't know that you need to, for personally, I don't think you need to repeat your mission and your vision. Um, yeah. Mission safety is what we do. That's because it's our mission. Would you, this is board member Beeman, um, would you be better? I don't like the redundancy of health 
or a healthy, mm -hmm. um, would you feel more comfortable with patient care and insinuating safety there? Or like, I don't know, patient care. Better. You're right. I don't like that they're both, there's health and healthy. Patient goals might be the, I, I mean, so, you know, sometimes patients' goals are different from Absolutely. What we are, and I think when you're working and partnering with patient care. patients, patient goals, that is, is as important as what we think they should do. And I don't think all professionals remember the goal of the patient part. They only know what this is, what I was taught you needed to do. <laughs> It's so are you absolutely. suggesting changing this to care? I say yes, yeah, changing health, that patient health to patient care so, for a healthy Oregon. Yes. I told you I wrote a book, right? So I have written stuff. Oh. I, I would prefer not to have health and healthy yeah, right. in the same sentence. So, but care is a good word. So. Yeah. Our goals, but that's just my person's opinion. Care is that. encompasses it also oh, and respecting. You would hope so. Yeah. I'm sorry. It should. Oh, I was responding to board member. This is board member Beam, and I was responding to board member Chen, and and the care encompasses the patient goals because it's the whole plan and what and that should encompass the goals of the patient. Although should and does are different things sometimes in life, but um, I, I think that the care is a is more encompassing. That's just my opinion. I'm just one person. I'm okay with care. I'm just saying that. Listen to what their goals are. Well, it's sort of saying if you think about it, the cause and effect, patient care helps ensure a healthy Oregon. Mm -hmm. So it's it's kind of we do this, we get this. Um we have patient twice, but that's probably want to be patient centered, it's probably okay. Um staff member Davis, I wondered if one of the patients should be replaced with public, but I don't know. Public care, public. And it was public health, right? I don't know. Yes. And say public health for healthy care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That yeah. is going yeah. to be public health. Patient care. Patient care. So, are you saying you like the Republic to replace one of those? Just throwing an idea out there. Yeah. I don't have a preference. And this is board member Chin. We're also uh, repeating yeah. in the Should. in the advance and protect. We we have that in our mission. And so if we're trying to to just be more specific with our vision without repeating our mission, I yeah. don't know that protect needs to be in there. Um, so here is a suggestion. I think, I, I mean, my gut would be, yeah, protect and protect. Maybe it, it's okay to leave it in the mission and not worry about having infection. But here's really what we try to do. But I tend to advise organizations I'm working with on the vision is you, you begin with a an aspirational statement, which is what this present, and then you can add to that sort of descriptions of what the outcomes you want to accomplish are, and it can tie to specific short-term goals in the strategy. It can be things that you don't expect to accomplish for 10 years, right? But it kind of helps explain, well, you know, what would this be, right? So it could be, you know, access, you know, it could be, you could have one for each of the pillars, actually, but in that, that sort of makes the vision both aspirational, but also meaningful from a more concrete point of view. Now, to do that takes some work. We're not going to have time to do it here unless you guys want to skip dinner. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it might make sense to have a little more work with a group kind of trying to say, OK, we've got this and then maybe some descriptive statements under this that would be, you know, flesh the whole thing out and not just be sort of a quasi restatement of the mission, but mm -hmm. be a little bit more Mm -hmm. Specific in terms of what the accomplishments might be. So, board member Chen. This is board member Chen, and I, I, I 
appreciate that comment about uh, flashing out and then maybe some bullet points to not reach everything all at one time, but if whomever is looking at this and might be on a subcommittee, I think when we think about health, we're always thinking about health without palliative care and a good death. I think that we have to make sure that that's part of our pharmacists are involved in palliative care and we have to do the whole spectrum of life. And I think that that's often missed in um, how we look at care for people. So keep, just keep that in your bubble when you're thinking about what our goals are for what health is. There is healthy dying too. Or, oh, not there. Better goals for dying. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean. Okay. Um, so I guess um, we can sort of, I'm not putting anything to it as vote, but from a sort of informal point of view um, of the board members who would be in favor, this is not a formal vote, would be in favor of setting up a small group, maybe three board members to, and I guess we can help facilitate that if you'd like to kind of work on not necessarily messing too much with this, because I think it's pretty good as it is, but then to kind of define what some of the more specific outcomes could be that kind of broaden it a little bit more, make it more tangible. So how many think that would be a good idea as an action item coming out of this meeting? Need hands or not hands, not a good idea, or just leave it at this and forget all the rest of that stuff. And settle, then just have this be our new vision. So, I guess the first question is let's leave this and not mess any further. Hands up if you want to do that. Okay. Let's do a little bit more work on it with a selective voluntold to do a little more work and then come back to the board to present some draft language. Okay. Looks pretty unanimous. <laughs> Uh, my hand is up for uh, oh, the, the, public. the public is not able to see hands. Oh, so it's uh, best if we verbally okay. uh, acknowledge our, ourselves uh, if we are responding yes to your question. Okay, it's not a policy decision, it's just an action item that we're going to take. Fair word, right? yes, In, within okay, good. So then, um, so we already. No hands went up for leave it, just this. So the next question is, who's in favor of having a small group kind of do a little more work on fleshing this out a little bit? So I'm going to go, this time I'm going to go in, in row order. I'm starting with um, Board Member Dole, Doyle. Uh, board Member Doyle, I uh, support the second option. I would also advocate for the th a third option would be to continue vision. There are some um, language construct things mm -hmm. that I have difficulty with. Okay. They're understood. Yeah, board member just I echo that. All right. Good. Remember Patel? So, yeah, we can work on that. Okay. Good. Board member Veeman, I agree. Okay. Member I am with the third option. Okay. Fair enough. Um, Board member. Board member Hemmings, so a clarification. What are the different options? I know one is to do nothing. The second one is to work on it with a select people. Work that right. It's and then to, to, to draft some language rather than do it as a you know a, 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 a herd or of a small group. And the third option is to work on it. To, yeah, to work on this too. So the first one was just add the second third option is do some more editing on this and also add some. So leaving this statement un, you know, open for re some revision. So it's it's not dramatically different. Just we you know we think we still may want to make some tweaks to the. So the difference between the second and the third option. The second option would be a select group of people who would work on that revision, and the third option is all board everyone. Yes. No. Hey, that's what I heard. That's, that's exactly what I heard. It's 
No. Well, this, I think it was, I had said, this was my mistake. I had said the option is to just add some stuff and leave this alone. Leave it as is. Yeah. And board member Doyle said, I'd still like the option to do some wordsmithing on this as part of that work. So we're basically, let's just make it one option now. <laughs> we're going to, you know, tweak this and add some stuff. Is everybody okay with that? Who's weak? Who's weak? Is that all of us or members? Board members or board and media? Yeah. I would. Well, it's up okay. to you. Okay. Right. So I can't tell you. I would suggest that it would be uh, two or three board members and two or three staff members kind of work. It's to be public. You cannot have a sphere public. It has to be. That would still have to be public. Okay. Yeah, it would have to be a public. And so why I don't think so? If it's not a, yeah, it would be a members meeting to make recommendations to the board. It would need to be a public. You can. That's fine. But it just needs to be a public notice meeting. And then we have to record it. Takes that right. Yep. Yeah. So and we may as well just put it in meeting. So the agents out there breaking that rules. Well, single head agents so have different been. rules. This is so. Yeah. So I don't want to talk. But for this board, if two or more board members meet to make recommendations to the board as a whole, it needs to. It's which is fine. It just needs to be a publicly yeah. noticed meeting. That's fine. Board member Vipperman, which is why the last time we did this, we did it all together. We spent an afternoon of yes. meeting doing this. Yes, we did all, all this parts. Yes, everybody. Yeah. Well, would that be your proposal? Is that a better option? I'm going to propose a motion. It's, oh, it, it's okay. actually okay. Director Fox. It, right, this. It, it it might be a little bit more. If, efficient if a couple members of, of the board staff and if there's one person on the board is recommended to work with staff and then we can share out information to everyone where we end up at the next board meeting at the next board meeting. discuss it next board meeting we would still get panel it would could be voted on at the next board meeting yeah yes yeah yeah i agree to that that sounds right all right so oh. option Maybe we're at path now. <laughs> um, so it's a couple staff, one board member, and we don't have to have a public meeting. Is that true? Yep. Okay. That was brilliant. Um, I will can't do math. Uh, yes. If I may just uh, throw a proposal out on it, uh, out onto the floor, uh, as I understood, is that the proposal is that a group of uh, at least two staff members and at maximum one board member uh, would meet uh, to used to work on the vision and any sub bullet points that are under that may be underneath this vision mm -hmm. and to prepare uh, something for consumption uh, at the December board meeting. Correct. So I uh, would like to go around and see if there's eyes to that. Yes. Member Doyle. Yes, that's okay. Okay. Uh, board member Doyle, yes. Board member Joyce, aye. Board member Patel. Board member Patel. I abstain. Member Beeman. Board member Beeman. Um, so it'll be presented to the entire board. Will there be further discussion at that point that everybody can feel comfortable? Because I I'm sensing that some board members are not comfortable with it just being one board member. I understand the not wanting to take another afternoon of meeting, not wanting to do this if it's just the word smithing. But I this is something that represents all of us, and I hesitate to say yes to this when. And I know we're a board, and sometimes we disagree, and sometimes we say no. But I don't want to put. I'm in favor of the vision and changing the statement, I just don't know that this is the correct route. Um, so I, I'm going to say no for this for right based based on. Yeah. OK. Member Bipperman. Board member Bipperman, no. OK. Board member Hemmings. Board member Hemmings, no, because I'm concerned about who that one board member would be and how what the selection process would be for that one board member. Okay. I'm not good at counting. Are you counting? 
Yes. Yes. We have one more board member. Okay. Yes. No, we have. Board, board member Hall. Um, first, it seemed like it was not a big deal. I think now I want to say no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we all need to be in this conversation. Yeah. Okay. Board member Chen. Um, board member Chen is going to abstain. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, if we need to come at this one more time, I mean, people just so in eight to yeah, abstain. Yeah. Yes, to six, so six, six people, people voted, voted, four people said no. So it's a yeah. So, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it went down. Um, Two, four, eight, four. Yeah. So let me open up to alternate proposals. What? What would sound good? Because I I heard we should do it as a full board, as part of a board meeting, and that's certainly an option. Or there's a more, you know, a different number of board and staff working off, you know, in a in a public meeting. Yes, and it would be in a public meeting. Mm Board member Vipperman, yes. uh, I would like all of us to have a say in this. It's an important uh, part of the Board of Pharmacy. This is our vision. Mm -hmm. It's it's our vision as board members. Um, every board member has a different idea, a different way they look at things. And I think that everybody's opinion counts when it comes some, to something like this. So I would... Um, like everyone to have a say in that and all us to do it as a board team. All right, so there's a proposal to have it an agenda item on a regular board meeting or a special board. When was that a special board meeting we did it before? I don't know. We, a regular board meeting. Yeah. A regular board meeting. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> and just from a logistics timing point of view, would there be time on the December meeting to include this? I would have done. It would be up to the board to decide what's going to go because I know that there's probably already a full agenda. Right. So if that were the avenue and it didn't come up until what would the next meeting be? February. February. Would there be time to put it on the agenda for February? I would okay. think so. So if if it didn't get brought to the board and further work on this until February, I mean that would probably be I'm seeing that's nodding. All right. So I guess. I'll state what I think is the next proposal is it be put on a full board meeting agenda in February to work as a full group on revising the vision. This can be the starting point, but then that will be the time when everybody can participate and hopefully agree at that time on an updated vision for the agency. All right, so that's the proposal and um, I'm going to go around the room backwards <laughs> just because I'm not good at this, but it's I can figure that out. All right. <laughs> yes, I know. Board member Chen approves. Okay. <laughs> Board member Hall, yes. Board member Hemmings. Board member Hemmings is uh, I just want to make sure I know what I'm agreeing to. <laughs> yeah. That we're all going to meet together sometime in February. At our board meeting. At the regular board meeting. To yeah. further discuss the vision statement. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yes. Right. Agreed. Uh, board member Vipperman agrees. Board member Veeman agrees. Board member Patel agrees. Joyce, yes. Board member Doyle, yes. <laughs> hey. I think uh, that's all we can do today was. As you noted, we're over time, so I think it's time to adjourn for today. And we'll have to be here till I like her calling out. Yeah, I'm sure. That was going last I need to conclude uh, orders of business as required of me by uh, for board business. Uh, we will have uh, a picture taking moment for board and staff uh, out here. Hopefully, we have enough sunlight left. Um, and then I, board member Doyle, lose uh, today's meeting at 6 at 4 41 p.m. Board member 10 seconds motion. Board member Beeman, yes. Board member Hall, yes. 
Board Member Hammonds, yes. Board Member Joyce, yes. yes. Board Member Patil, yes. Board Member Vipperman, yes. When, when oh, is wait, the picture, Kate? Picture is now. If <laughs>